tonight. A panel of Canada's top foreign policy and defense experts. University of Ottawa professor Roland Paris is here. He's a former senior advisor to the Prime Minister on global affairs and defense and served as an advisor to NATO's Secretary General. Louise Blay is a former Canadian ambassador to the UN. She's now an advisor to the Business Council of Canada and the Pendleton Group. Retired Lieutenant General Andrew Leslie is a former commander of Canada's Army, Chief Government Whip and Liberal MP. He's now a senior associate with Blue Sky Strategy Group. And Carrie Buck is Canada's former ambassador to NATO. She's now a senior fellow at the University of Ottawa. Hi, everybody. Really uh, a great honor to have you here on this important day to uh, mark the somber anniversary and, and reflect a little bit on the last year and what's to come. Uh, Ms. Buck, I wanted to start with you. You, you heard a couple clips there from uh, both the ambassador to Ukraine and Ukraine's ambassador to Canada on the likelihood of allies coalescing around the, the uh, need for fighter jets uh, for Ukraine. Do you expect allies to get to that point, the same point they were at a few months ago or a month and a half ago with tanks? Well, I'd be guessing, but my guess would be yes. Over the past year, we've seen important shifts. When I was at NATO, the question of lethal aid to Ukraine was not on the table. Uh, so early in the conflict, people shifted, countries shifted to say, yeah, they'll provide lethal aid. And then they moved along the course of the year and decided to give Leopard 2 tanks, uh, Abrams tanks. Um, so the conversation, as the ambassador in her ambassador in Kiev said, is about uh, fighter jets now. So I'm guessing, yes, they'll get to that point. But NATO's deliberations are pretty careful. They want to make sure that they're not crossing that line um, where they're seen as entering into direct conflict with Russia. What is so, inter so interesting, Professor Paris, about that line is the degree to which, as Ms. Buck pointed out, it has moved over the last year. I don't think if I were asking the Minister of Defense a year ago, are we going to be buying a missile defense system for Ukraine or um, you know, considering sending four tanks, uh, Leopard 2 tanks, the answer would have been yes. Uh, do you expect the line to keep moving and, and how difficult is it given what Ms. Buck outlined about the concerns of involving ourselves even further? Well, I, I think it is going to continue moving and it probably has to continue moving because Ukraine doesn't have a manpower advantage now uh, on the battlefield. It has to have a qualitative advantage in terms of its equipment. And, uh, you know, although um, I expect that we'll be moving in the direction of fighter jets. The discussion is often about what is the next weapon system. And I think sometimes we focus a bit too much on the particular weapon systems. If this is going to be a long drawn out war and all the indications are that it might be, the side that can replenish its uh, personnel and materiel uh, most efficiently, effectively, is the side that's going to have a huge advantage. So we really need to be thinking in the big picture, not so much what the next weapon system is. Are we going to be able to continue supplying Ukraine with the weapons, with the ammunition, with the financial supports that are going to be needed for it to sustain its war effort? Uh, General Leslie, uh, jumping off that point from Professor Paris, what, in your view, is the sustainability, in particular, of the level of military aid being uh, being uh, uh, given to Ukraine? Well, across NATO, there's vast amounts of equipment and soldiers. <clears throat> the question is readiness, whether or not the technological Sorry, I can't, capability... Sorry, I'm not sure if everyone can hear, but I can't hear you very well. I'm not sure if there's an issue with your audio, if you're on mute. Oh. You can, okay, you can hear me. Okay. okay. Uh, sorry, test, sorry test, General test. Leslie, do you mind... St there you go, I got you now. Do you mind starting again? My apologies. Quite all right. Across NATO, <laughs> there's a vast reservoir of equipment and personnel. But the question is, is how ready are they? That's a function of training. And for example, getting back to Professor Paris's point, um, there's an ammunition crisis throughout NATO, especially for artillery ammunition, because of the vast expenditures of the Ukraine against the Russians. And the Russians have an ammunition crisis as well, though I have no sympathy for them. So the bottom line is that NATO can and must be doing more, but so far the contributions have worked, though perhaps not as quickly as Ukraine might wish. When we talk about those contributions uh, working, Ms. Blay, when you think about the future or the next phase of this war, uh, how you know how soon might they might they work to? do more for Ukraine? I mean, obviously, they're working because Ukraine is outpacing every expectation placed on it throughout the last year. But they want more than just that. They want to win. 
Well, exactly. And I think as we've been alluding to, we find ourselves really in a war of attrition. And, and I would want to say a war by proxy. I think up until recently, it was really about just Ukraine defending itself and, and, the, and the West coming to its aid. But now it's really becoming, as you've heard from uh, President Putin, he's talking now about really that as far as he's concerned, he's in a war with the West. So we really are going to have to, to, to continue to have, be resilient, to be in it for the long run. And this will take a lot of patience and, yes, a lot of resources. And I, really looking forward, I think we also want to be careful that we have another flank to, to be watching out for. We, uh, we're really, there's a lot of, the United States is talking a lot about its worry about what might happen in the Pacific. So this is not the world that we used to live in three or four years ago. This, the world has changed. It's not as secure. And as we move forward in our support of Ukraine, I think we need to do this in the context, in a global context, and be very, very uh, wide-eyed and bright-eyed about, about uh, our need to really um, arm up and, and be prepared for, for what the world might have next for us. Uh, speaking of what the world might have, and more specifically Mr. Putin, uh, Ms. Buck, I, I, I found this week almost um, an exercise in contradictions in a way only because he really doubled down on the nuclear threat in a couple of addresses directed towards primarily a domestic audience. But then we also saw Joe Biden, the president of the U.S., visit over the weekend. The Russians were alerted to that fact. He took a train for a number of hours, and, and they didn't make a move. How do you assess the, the threat posed by Putin at this point? Well, I think the one thing we've learned about Mr. Putin from the start is that he's unpredictable. So um, figuring out what the threat is requires figuring out what he's going to do. And he's repeatedly done things that I've thought are against Russia's interest, like invade the entire country of Ukraine. Um, on the nuclear threat, he's been nuclear saber rattling for a number of years now. There's a slight difference. He's put um, his nuclear weaponry on higher alert, his, the staff, the military staff who uh, support deployment on higher alert, and they've developed new uh, weapons. So we have to be worried. Maybe he's bluffing, maybe he's not, but regardless, we have to be worried. So that's on the nuclear threat. Um, from the beginning, when the West started flowing arms into Ukraine, um, Russia could have attacked some of those supply lines. They've chosen not to. I think Putin understands that um, effectively doing something like that would be effectively declaring war on NATO. That's not a good place. He's already losing in Ukraine. I don't know how much he realizes that. But doing something that would be seen as a direct attack on NATO, uh, he's, he's avoided that. Um, and we hope he'll continue to avoid that. Do you think, though, again, circling back, I know not to be specific on the weapon, but given the evolution of the types of weapons being provided to Ukraine, that becomes a bigger risk. Well, I, I think the biggest risk would be a kind of catastrophic collapse of the Russian right. military. Um, so far, you know, he was making nuclear threats months ago. Uh, he backed off the nuclear, the very direct nuclear threats, uh, perhaps not coincidentally after China and India were both saying, cool it with this military talk, uh, with this nuclear talk. Uh, it's, it's been less discussed, but it doesn't mean that it's gone away as a potential risk. Having said that, um, you know, he has made so, there have been so many strategic blunders by Russia. And it just seems again and again they have not learned from the poor experiences that they've had from the initial invasion on. Even this latest so-called offensive seems to have been launched by Russia too early when they really weren't uh, ready for it. So, uh, you know, I think that the nuclear consideration is one that's always there. The potential for escalation is always there. And that is the reason for caution in terms of uh, uh, direct NATO involvement and, and more uh, longer range weapons. But we have been seeing that line creeping, and I expect it will continue to creep. General Leslie, I, I was thinking as I was talking to Professor Paris of covering this government when it first started. And, and Professor Paris, you were advising the Prime Minister, General Leslie, you were in the government. And we would have had completely you know, very different conversations about, in particular, Russia, but, but also China. And to Ms. Blay's point and, and Ms. Buck's, the world feels like a very different place right now. And I'm wondering what you think the implications are more specifically for Canada 
as it shapes its foreign policy going forward about the sort of definitive way in which we now can characterize our adversaries? We've been great supporters of the rule of law. We're extraordinarily proud of our peacekeepers. And quite frankly, I don't think most Canadians are willing to invest or were willing to invest in defense tools that would keep us safer in an alliance context. Times have changed. So we have to invest in defense. We have to defend our Arctic. We have to know what's going on up there. We have to provide capabilities that are actually useful today instead of yesterday. And we have to develop a bit of a sense of urgency, which I don't see in this current government. So D&D, for example, hands back in two to three billion dollars a year that's supposed to be sent on equipment. That hasn't changed for the last eight or 10 years. So let's fix that. Let's send those troops to Latvia that we promised we would, but they should already be there. Let's send more vehicles for our troops in Latvia. Let's contribute more to the defense of Ukraine by opening the coffers instead of handing back the money to the Minister of Finance. So a little bit more, please. Uh, Ms. Blay, and I'll, I'll conclude by circling back to, to your point and jumping off what um, General Leslie said. I think that I mean, I have noticed a, a, certainly a change in rhetoric, a change in posture, I would say, from the federal government on a lot of the issues that, that General Leslie laid out. And changing their posture isn't going to be easy because of not just this government, but governments prior, the level of investment in defense or, or lack thereof, for example. It's not something that's going to change overnight. Do you think, though, that the broader or higher level of public co um, cognizance of what's going on in Ukraine, for example, the threat Russia poses, the threat China poses, like the degree to which we talk about it as a society versus 10 years ago even, do you think that will maintain pressure on successive federal governments in this country to do the stuff that General Leslie just laid out? Well, I, I think so, absolutely. And I, I believe, you know, I, I saw a poll just recently that talked about, yes, Canadians are fully 100 percent behind Ukraine. But when you the questions probe into deeper into how much we should uh, send in terms of aid, money and weapons and the support goes down, we, we really do need to educate Canadians and, 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 and to let them know that our own security is completely tied up into into all of this. And, and I think that's very important. I also think that we need to bolster our diplomacy. I, I was really encouraged to mm. see what happened today at the UN, 141 countries in support mm. of uh, the UN Charter and, and the sovereignty, the integrity, uh, you know, the, the, the importance to maintain integral sovereignty. And, 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 you know, you look at the number of countries that voted no, it's, it's a really small group. Um, there's a few people who didn't show and weren't in the room. But let's just mm -hmm. keep working. I think Canada has a lot of pull in diplomatic circles. I, of course, from my time in the UN, I know that with Bob Ray there. I think there's a lot of work we could, should be doing diplomatically. But I fully agree with uh, General Leslie that we should at the same time not be uh, completely naive and make sure that we can protect our own country if, if the day came where we really needed to. And I think that's the message we should okay. be taking from this past year. Okay, on that note, I'm going to leave it there. Really appreciate the discussion this evening. Thanks so much to Roland Paris, Carrie Buck, General Andrew Leslie, and Louise Blaise.